based how we've addressed them, some of the lessons we've learned, and also some ideas we have for the future. So I think guess many people, when they think of Technicolor, they think of what's on the left side of the screen. You think of the movies, the films, uh, and that's still a big part of what we do as a company, right? But we also make uh, devices, boxes for the connected home, right? Uh, set of boxes, gateways that allow people at home to watch movies and enjoy the internet. Um, and for the last four years, we've been working with OpenRT and now Lead as well uh, in some of these products and more and more of these products, right? And to date now, many millions of these products that we're uh, bringing to market now run OpenWRT inside. Now, as a company, we, we are in a somewhat different position than I think many of you are when you work with OpenWRT. Uh, and that is the fact that we're squeezed in between uh, a number of other parties uh, in the industry, right? So we're the red box over there. On the far right, you have people like all of us who have these devices at home, but you are not our direct customer, right? as, in, as you would be in retail. We have uh, a party in between, our direct customers being the internet service providers, right? which you all know. So we face, uh, let's say, some different conditions than, than uh, some other members of the community when we work with OpenWRT. First of all, we have a very big scale of operations, so we're talking about hundreds of products that we uh, maintain, uh, tens of millions of homes that we address with these products. And the requirements that we have to fulfill uh, can be very extensive, as I'm sure some of my colleagues here in the room uh, know very well. Okay, so beyond, the, let's say, the classic router functions that you, you all know, we have very extensive, let's say, managed service requirements, so bringing IPTV services, bringing voice over IP services, being able to remotely manage all of these things, one of those uh, key things that we have to develop on top. What's also special is that we have access to the component vendors, so the big chip makers, manufacturers in the world, uh, to their code. Okay, to their specific drivers, to their specific kernels, uh, their specific hardware uh, features as well. Which is also a challenge because, for example, in the, in the presentation given just now, uh, sometimes we are not able to, to leverage some of these uh, innovations, I would say, in open source because we are using proprietary drivers, right? Then, okay, we have high quality expectations, I'm sure that goes for everyone, right? but we have very strict uh, requirements in terms of uptime, quality of service uh, of our boxes. And all of this, of course, also translates into very robust software processes that we have inside, and I'm sure also many of you working in, 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 in larger companies know that those can be very complicated. Um, so let's say all of these uh, dynamics in the market that we're in uh, influence the way that we work with OpenWRT. <coughs> Before I go into some of the examples, I want to share with you why we actually chose and choose OpenWRT in the first place for our products, right? So many years ago, for, 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 your, for your information, we, we used to have our own software stack completely developed in-house. And this was, I think, the norm many years ago for many companies on our market. But at a certain point in time, we, started, we decided to move to a more open source approach, and we've been very happy with that. And the main reasons are, first of all, that you know, OpenWRT is really a good platform for us, it's been a good platform for us, because it provides all of the, let's say, the base requirements that we need. And because it's so modular and, and platform agnostic from, from the inception, it's been very easy for us to extend on this and build our, our products on top. Okay, so that's one reason. The second is OpenRT is extremely accessible. Okay, so everyone can get their hands on OpenRT and start working with it. Okay, there are no, there's no red tape, there are no restrictions, there are no contracts to sign. Okay, and this has really made it, uh, I would say, a reference platform for a lot of people working on routers in whatever shape or form. And that's led to the right, uh, let's say, benefit that we see is that OpenRT has a very diverse ecosystem. And again, we can see this here today. Uh, many different uh, people working with OpenRT for many different reasons, and that allows us also to, to, to benefit from the innovations that sometimes come from outside of our market uh, and use, uh, use those in our products. So some facts and figures. So this pie chart shows you more or less the distribution today of our products, of our software and our products. How much of that is coming from open source through OpenWRT, which you see on the right side in the blue? How much of that on the left side we add on top uh, as Technicolor, so software that we write on top? And then a few other slices you see on the top, top left, 
coming from other sources, uh, mainly our component vendors. Okay? So this just to give you an idea of, of the distribution that we are in today. Uh, on the right side, you know, we, we, we can reuse heavily from the base platform uh, all the open narrative framework uh, packages, the standard networking functions and various applications coming from the packages feeds. Right? And then, okay, on the left side, as I hinted to before, many of the things we still do in-house, which are not some things that you find off the shelf, are the typical operator internet service provider features, okay? Now, we have a very committed uh, strategy when working with Open and Open Source, in that we want to achieve a good balance uh, between what's on the right side of the pie chart and what's on the left side of the pie chart, okay? So for us, it, it makes sense to contribute some of the software that we, uh, we add or that we change. We've done this in the past, uh, many occasions. And the reasons why, are, I guess, are obvious, is that we want to strengthen the software base of the community, right? Because it's, it's important for us, uh, and we hope that it becomes um, important for, for more people. Um, at the same time, we want to stimulate other people to contribute, right? So you can only stimulate that if you contribute yourself. Um, we want to increase the quality of the code by having more eyes looking at the code, right? And then maybe more selfish reason, reason, we also want to reduce the maintenance cost because if we would be starting to patch all over the place, maintaining our own versions of things, it would basically be a kind of a fork and, and we don't want to do that. At the same time, I want to share with you as well, we as a company in, in a business, we also have reasons not to contribute and we're very rational about that. Sometimes there are things that we want to keep for ourselves because we believe it gives us an advantage as a company, okay? So we are also, you know, we really think about those things. Um, we will never have all our software in open source for that reason. Another reason can be uh, licensing. So for a big company like Technicolor, open source licenses is a big deal and we have to navigate our internal policies, our legal uh, policies, our IP policies. And in some cases, the answer is that it's not compatible, okay? And finally, the last one, which I think is a very important one to keep in mind, uh, it's to make a contribution and to maintain a contribution is not something you do for free. It requires effort on, on the people who are doing that. And there has to be a chance of adoption, okay? If, if we would throw something in open source and nobody uses it, it's been wasted effort for everyone, okay? So those are some factors why we, as a company, like to contribute and why we, in some cases, don't contribute. Um, basically, we want to achieve this, this right balance for us. Giving you some, some examples uh, of things we've done in the past and uh, some plans we have. So sometimes it's about adding new features. And some of you may be aware. Uh, sometimes it's about uh, making, uh, let's say, some existing software in OpenRT, let's say, ready for field deployment in our environment. So improving uh, functionality, fixing bugs, things like that. It can be simple things like stepping up packages uh, or adding configuration options. Um, so there are many different ways to contribute. It doesn't always have to be adding complete software packages. It can be in many different ways. There is also an example of an, what we would call an unsuccessful contribution. Maybe some of you who were here last year remember that Hans, my colleague, talked about M1, which is a package that we use and we still use it. Um, we put it on, on uh, open source, we talked about it, we, but we didn't really get anyone else uh, to be really interested in that, and it happens, okay? So that's also something you have to, to be aware of. And then we have some future things uh, in mind. I think Eric hinted at that as well this morning, that a lot of people are now thinking about TR69, which is a very important protocol for uh, remote management in our business. Um, we have uh, promised that a while ago that we would contribute uh, some of our code, and we now have, I think since yesterday, so we're right on time, uh, our first parts of this software uh, on GitHub. Everyone can access it. And Dirk, who's sitting over there, I welcome you to go. Dirk, wave your hand, chat with him if you have questions. So we put it out there. We hope people like it. Uh, we hope you think it's good. It worked for us. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. Then my colleague Johan will talk about one sensing later on, which could be a future contribution as well. Device discovery would be another such example, okay? So there, we have some, some plans. So enough about contributions. Um, another uh, special case of our working in our business is that we work with component vendors, as I mentioned. So what are the, some of the differences that we face in that respect? The reference software that we get from these guys is not always OpenWRT based, okay? Sometimes it's just a standard Linux you know, reference kit 
uh, or sometimes it is OpenWRT based, but not really OpenWRT done, done properly. Okay, so you have, maybe you use the base framework, but then you have a bunch of proprietary stuff on top. It doesn't really mesh very well. We have lots of different kernels to work with, right? And uh, you know, uh, these guys, uh, and this is normal actually in our industry as well, that you have to have some stability, not always on the latest and greatest. So there are different kernels that we have to maintain, sometimes older, sometimes newer than what is in, available in the latest OpenWRT release. Then there's functionality which is offered by these guys which is not available uh, in the vanilla OpenWRT, so we have to make that fit somehow. And uh, we've talked about uh, hardware abstraction layers and, and uh, things like that, so we need to fit that in. And then probably one of the biggest problems is that different vendors implement the same things in different ways, okay? Uh, that's always a pain to, make, to, to, to reconcile those things. Giving you an example of these kernel versions, so uh, we currently have to maintain in our products a 3.3, a 3.4, a 3.10, a 3.18, a 4.1 for all kinds of different chips and different products. Now, interestingly, and I guess it's not a coincidence, OpenWRT, for some magical reason, has always been at some stage in time aligned with those kernel versions. So I guess there was some, there was some smart people behind the scenes making those decisions. Unfortunately, if you take the latest uh, Chaos Calmer or you take the main today, you only have support for the mo more recent kernels. Okay, so that's something that we have to maintain. And happy to discuss more with people around, uh, around the, the table here if we could work together on this because I'm sure others face the same problem. And then the last point is, okay, I mentioned these extensions, so how do we, how do we add all these additional features that we have to integrate into OpenWRT, okay? And one way that we've addressed that is by basically using the framework which exists, and that is UCI and UBUS. So I'll give you one example. as DSL, okay? So we make products that support ADSL, VDSL, GFAST, things like that. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have DSL at home. It's quite a complicated technology, right? It's, it has proprietary uh, hardware requirements that you wouldn't find in a retail router. Um, you have a physical layer, you have the ATM or the PTM layer, you have the PPP or DHCP on top of the network stack. So lots of things going on uh, that need to be configured. Uh, then you have to check the status of that during the runtime of the box, you have to get statistics. So complicated stuff and the problem statement, let's say, is that in OpenWT, if you would look uh, to, a, to a vanilla situation, you would have only very basic configuration parameters for DSL which is normal because I think most people in the community don't necessarily need that. They will just use an ethernet connection, okay? But we need that. Um, so what have we, we done? We've, we've extended UCI and UBUS to support these additional uh, requirements, okay? That was the easiest way for us to, to make it fit into OpenWRT without having to create uh, complicated abstraction schemes. So to give you an example, and this is just an example, and don't get hung up on the, on the, the text here, but the left is what you would find in a very basic OpenWRT situation. The right are all the different type of configuration options that we have needed to add, and that's not even an exhaustive list, okay? So the message I want to give here is that, you know, it, it's possible just by using UCI and UBUS to actually support all of these extensions without having to fundamentally change the framework at all, all right? Then there's another example, we talked about it already a few times, TR69, so for those of you, you that don't know, it's a protocol to manage a gateway remotely, okay? It's managed remotely by the operator, by the internet service provider, to upgrade the firmware, to change the settings, you know, things like that. So here the problem statement is that the, the language, let's say, that is spoken uh, has been defined by a standard body, the broadband forum, over time, hundreds, thousands of parameters, and it's completely different than what UCI and UBUS speak as a language, okay? Con s the scope is necess not necessarily very different, but the language is different. So how do we get those things to speak to each other, okay? So here we've, uh, again, addressed this partially by extending UCI, making it fit better. We've also addressed this by creating a mapping framework, what we call Transformer, which is a mapping framework which allows you to map between data model A to data model B. And that's what uh, I just, the GitHub URL I just shared is uh, where we've put the first drop of that uh, online, okay? So to give you an example of this again in, 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 uh, in, in real uh, data, so on the left you would see the Wi-Fi, the very basic Wi-Fi configuration used in OpenWRT. So you have an interface and a device, okay? And for whatever reasons, which I, I won't even try to explain in, in one of the TR69 protocols, standards, 
they've decided to map, to define, I would say, Wi-Fi into three blocks, a radio, an SSID, and an access point. Okay, there, I'm sure there are very good reasons for this, but you see there are two on the left and three in the middle, right, which is a problem. So a very simple solution, in fact, is what we've done, is we've basically split up in our UCI model the Wi-Fi into the device, an interface, and an AP, and it, it maps more cleanly. So it's a small thing, eh? but you know, by doing this, and, and I hope that we are somehow going to be able to share this as well with the community, by doing these simple changes, it can make life a lot easier for us. And I don't think it makes the life more difficult for the rest, okay? So another example. Finally, and before I stop, so I'm sure also a lot of people working in the software business know what this is like. So we have to manage a lot of software releases, right? Especially working with open source, we have all these different life cycles going on of different packages that we use. In the old days, we just did our own thing. We were happy, it was easy. Yeah, now we rely on all these different uh, release tracks. So you can see at the very top, we depend on X amount of component vendor kernels and driver versions. Then we depend on OpenWT releases and now also ladder uh, releases, right? The third line is our technical or internal release schedule because of course we also have to maintain a mainline chunk for development and stable releases as well. And then finally our customers, the internet service providers, they also have their projects uh, schedules, right? So this is a reality, I guess, for a lot of us in the software world. Um, and we can say that we've learned a lot in the last years about how to work with open source, how to make this uh, work. And the first one, and I guess it's stating the obvious, but I'll state it again, don't fork. It's very hard to go back, and we've been very radical about this internally. We do try to stay up to speed with what's going on in open source, even if it means we have to change some things, right? But if you don't do it, you will fork and you will never get back. Okay, that's one. Second is don't, don't stay on an old version too long. When we originally started working with OpenWRT in 2012, we took AA. We started building on AA. We wanted to get our first products out, so we said let's stay on AA for a while, even though BB had come out, right? And then finally this year we went to CC, you know, we were late to do that, let's say, and it was a lot of work. We did it, we're very happy that we did it, but it was a lot of work. And we all realize that we'll never do this again. From now on, we'll always go to the next version, right? So it's also something we've learned. Don't stay back too long. Take small steps yeah, and take regular steps. For example, uh, some people in our team, every sprint, we work in sprints, every sprint we synchronize with what's going on in OpenWRT, okay? The fourth point is I think also very important and I hope we can also improve this somehow is that we need to Think about how we can align roadmaps. Yeah, on one hand, we have to align roadmaps with our component vendors. We have to align roadmaps with our customers. We also want to align roadmaps with the community, and this has not been very easy for us so far, but this would be, I think, a good point of improvement if we could somehow know more about what we are all doing and when. This would help uh, our work. And finally, and, and I think there's a talk about board farm today, so things like continuous integration, uh, and validating all these dependencies that we have is a, really a, a key thing that we have to do. So to wrap up, I hope uh, that you all understand that uh, OpenWT and Leda is, is very important for Technicolor and for our customers, so we're very happy with it. It's important for our business. Um, we believe that we've shown that it can work in the carry industry, right? It's not been easy necessarily. You need some dedication to OpenWT and some, some perseverance, but it works. In, uh, so I hope we're a good example. Um, we do look forward to working together with everyone and uh, making it better. And we do hope also that you feel the same way. Okay, so thank you. If you have any questions. Okay, that's easy.